My name is Kat Leo. I'm uh, actually a rheumatologist, so I am a clinical researcher coming kind of on the other side, so I consider myself more of an end user. And I was fortunate enough during my training to also come up with the I2V2 project. So I was kind of cross trained in kind of traditional clinical epidemiology, clinical research, and observational cohorts, clinical trials, and with the bioinformatics group as I2V2 was taking off. So what Paul asked to ask me to talk about today was what I've done with the I2B2 platform from the research side. And uh, I'm going to go through a case study about one of my diseases that I study, which is rheumatoid arthritis. So, and he also tasked me to end with a tools wish list, which I think is already has already been addressed based on what Transmart can do. So um, maybe I'll just alter that a little bit when we get to the slide. So I wanted to start with I2B2. So um, I2B2 was this it was more than just an instance, more than just a application, it was a project. It was a project that required lots of people. Uh, and as you can see, you recognize that, the ringleader over there, you see Sean over there, um, which uh, the art video architecture that I2D2 was built upon. Um, in the very front, the woman in orange is Tanshi Kai, who is a professor of biostatistics at the School of Public Health. Um, I'm pointing her out because a lot of the methods I'm going to talk about are um, continued collaborations between Tanshi and myself after the I2D2 project has ended. But I just wanted to stress that this project is not one person, it was an entire team of clinical researchers, geneticists, bioinformaticians, biostatisticians, medical informaticians, database programmers to make it all happen. All right, so um, in terms of the project itself, uh, I was part of the Driving Biology Project. So the way Zach had organized the ITV2 project, the Driving Biology Project, is said, let's come up with a scientific question, and then let's build the tools and platforms needed to answer that question. And it, these driving biology projects had focused on certain diseases, and rheumatoid arthritis is one of those diseases. So I'm a rheumatologist, very interested in rheumatoid arthritis, so I joined the project to try to figure out how we can study rheumatoid arthritis using the electronic medical records. One thing that I should probably preface is I know this isn't um, a, you know, not a bunch, I'm used to talking to clinical researchers, but the, the EMR, actually saying EMR data, is um, as that described as liberating data. So, Typically, traditionally, the way we study data, we have this big prospective cohort study, like the Richard Health study, Framingham Heart study, where you recruit thousands of patients, you have to ask them questionnaires, follow them over years, and it invest a lot of money, a lot of time. So it takes about you know, five, six years to recruit even the patients who do a study. Uh, now, with the electronic medical record data, we knew the data were in there, but we couldn't get at the data. We have the billing codes, where the accuracy of these codes can be very variable. And you also have all these unstructured data, which are really useful, but you can't get them out short of reviewing these data. And so what the project did is it provided a platform to help us extract these data in an organized way that we can study. And I'll go into a little more detail about that. So before I start, let me give you a little bit of an example of what is, or an idea of what is rheumatoid arthritis, because this is the example we're going to go through. Uh, so let me just show you. So on the, let's see, on the right side up here is a normal joint. Uh, joint is technically two bones connected by a tendon. And, you know, your knee, let's just pretend this is the knee here. Um, it, you have the joint and cartilage, you have a nice synovial lining, this nice lubricating fluid. So when you go for a run, you know, you don't feel creepy, it doesn't hurt. What happens is uh, for most people, you get something called osteoarthritis, tear of the joints. Um, over time, you get wearing of the wearing away of the cartilage, and eventually, not everyone, but some people get to bone on bone. The synovial fluid is still there, it's there to cushion, it's there still to lubricate, but you have that pain because you got your bone grinding against the bone. And rheumatoid arthritis is different. Um, it is an inflammatory joint disease. It's an autoimmune disease where for some reason the body gets confused and your immune system starts going after the components of the joint. So as you can see here, the synovial lining is now very inflamed. The fluid is inflamed. And from all this inflammation, you get all this extra inflammatory fluid that actually is eating away at the cartilage and the bone. And over time, if this isn't treated, you get destruction of the joint. And so 50 years ago, rheumatoid arthritis was a disease that definitely ended in uh, severe disability. Fortunately, now we have a lot of great treatments. But the question now is, which of these treatments are going to work? I think somebody mentioned it was the depression medication. So you need to go through eight medications before you know that something's going to work. And rheumatoid arthritis, we now have this wonderful armamentarium, but our first line treatment, methotrexate, is great, but we know that it'll only work 30% of the time. And then people cycle through about five or six medications after that until you figure out what's the right, what's the one that will work the best for that particular patient. 
Um, so let me just to give you an example of what a rheumatoid arthritis can, someone with rheumatoid arthritis, um, their hand will look like after some time is over time you get this bone deformity and chronic swelling of joints such that you know, some of these fingers can no longer be used to grasp objects. Fortunately, nowadays, this is typically, this is people don't progress to the stage anymore with the right treatment as we catch them early. All right, so that's an overview of rheumatoid arthritis. And one other thing I want to mention, because I'm going to go into it, is one particular aspect of this disease that's a little uh, different from some of the other autoimmune diseases is that you develop autoantibodies. Some autoimmune diseases you do, others you don't. And we'll go back into this autoantibody question in a little bit. All right, so let me go into an overview of the RAIGD2 project. So in order to study any disease, you need to be able to phenotype it. And that is really one of the as a clinical researcher with all these big data and EMR data, we know the data are in there, but we can't do very much if we don't have any confidence that the phenotype is what we're actually studying. Gil, didn't you just ask that question? How do you know you have what you're studying? And the answer is you don't if you use ICD-9 codes. If you take one ICD-9 code, which is a billion code for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you were to take 100 patients who have that billion code, only 50 of them will actually have rheumatoid arthritis. So is that bad? Uh, so you really have to go back to the EMR and extract other types of data, put it into an algorithm so that you could have some confidence or that can inform, uh, you have some confidence that you have the majority of rights. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into algorithm development in detail, but I will go through the overall concepts. The main thing that I think really helped us with our algorithm was access to that unstructured data. So, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, one of the pathognomonic signs is a bone erosion. There's no IC9 code for bone erosion. But if it's in the note, it's very specific and it's very informative regarding whether that patient has rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and so what the I2B2 platform allowed us to do is, you know, we took this messy EMR data that was not very structured for billing, not for research, put it into this relational I2B2 database where you have the billing codes in a surgical manner, then you have the notes in a manner that you can access them, process them using natural language processing, and then pull out these data that you think might be potentially useful, such as bone erosions, and symptoms such as morning sickness. So together, we developed an algorithm with all those variables uh, to predict rheumatoid arthritis. And so this is just a schematic of a general method we developed uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, and then we eventually applied for the development of algorithms for other phenotypes, including diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, coronary artery disease. I think um, Sean actually just showed a slide from the biobank of these different phenotypes. So those are from uh, the algorithms developed during IGB2. How do you know they actually have the disease? It's that last step. After you develop the algorithm, uh, you know, the classification algorithm is a type of machine learning algorithm. Fly back to the EMR. But once you get to your predicted cases, the physician still has to go back in there and review those cases to give you that positive predictive value, that accuracy. So there is um, there is still some supervision in these algorithms. All right, so we took structured data, unstructured data, developed an algorithm with help from machine learning because we had a lot of variables. We would take that algorithm, we apply it back to the EMR. So at the time, we had roughly 5 million patients in the EMR. And then we got about 5,000 RA cases out of there. We did some validation to prove that this was rheumatoid arthritis. And then from there, we have our RAI2B2 EMR research problem. And so on the right side, we now have a data set of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and a whole uh, now organized electronic medical record data where we can pull the data out of a little bit easier, enriched with natural language processing. On the other side is, um, is samples. So many institutions now you know, have the capability to link their biorepositories with an electronic medical record. Uh, at Partners, we uh, initially use Crimson. It's a method to, uh, to collect discarded blood samples. So you can actually do this relatively quickly. So let's say you have 3,000 patients that I identified with RA, so I'm interested in their bloods. If that patient happens to walk into the hospital and they have extra blood left over, it would be collected and set aside for the study. So I mentioned it took, you know, we have a prospective traditional RA cohort here. It took about five years to recruit about you know, 600 patients. We were able to have uh, samples on about 1,500 patients in 18 months using this discarded, uh, this uh, sample collection system. That's Crimson. Of course, there are, uh, won't go into the details, there's a lot of red tape if you're gonna collect discarded samples without you know, consenting each individual person. The other method is the biobank that Sean had mentioned. 
this system is consenting every single person. So if you were to be a, if you're a researcher using EMR data, you said, I'm interested in this patient, you collect their sample and they've fully consented, then uh, you don't have to break the link in terms of the link between the, the identified patient data and the sample. So that really, uh, it opens up more opportunities, but you don't have as many samples. So for diseases such as, as rheumatoid arthritis, which are not as common, you may not have enough samples to do the studies that you need to do. All right, so that's our platform. And what you can do with that is now you have a plasma, so we collected plasma and bumpy code. Now you can get genetic data, you can genotype them. And what we did is I'm interested in their autoantibodies. And so let's go back to the autoantibodies. RA patients produce a lot of autoantibodies. We don't know why, it's some break intolerance, uh, but there is some specificity of these autoantibodies. Everybody seems to have uh, antibodies against citrullinated peptides. What are those? Those are just you know, peptides or proteins, you have those all over your body. You have inflammation, for some reason you citrullate them. So it's really just the arginine getting switched to citrulline. So this happens in the aorta of patients with cardiovascular disease. This happens in the gut of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. This happens in the joints of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. But nobody else develops autoantibodies auto against those peptides. It just seems like it's patients with rheumatoid arthritis for some reason. So, um, and in fact, anti-CCP, or antibodies against cyclic citrullinated peptides, is a diagnostic marker for RNA. Doesn't mean you definitely have it, but it, it's what we use as part of the diagnosis. Um, so, uh, but it's proprietary because this was developed by, um, by a commercial company, so you don't know what's in that mix. And so researchers went back and said, well, what are the proteins, the citrullinated proteins that are related to rheumatoid arthritis? If we took joint, we took a joint, or synovial lining from someone with RA, we ground it up, and we ran it through mass spectroscopy and NMR, what did we see? What kind of proteins are in there? They found proteins such as citrullinated fibrinogen, citrullinated vimentin, uh, citrullinated enolase, I don't remember any of those names, but just there's a bunch of them. And they said, okay, now let's measure these autoantibodies in RA patients. And what they found is that, you know, maybe some patients would have high fibrinogen, but low enolase, low enolase, but high vimentin. So clearly there's some variation or heterogeneity even among the RA patients, what types of autoantibodies they had. But, you know, we're like, oh, great, that's cool, but what does it all mean? Like, we don't know. So the traditional approach, in the way we would have done it in epidemiology, is you take a big prospective cohort of patients, you define your outcomes of interest, you say, hmm, I'm not sure what these autoantibodies would do, but I think maybe it might be related to cardiovascular disease, maybe it might be related to pneumonia. So I gotta review the charts. So let's say I have 1,500 patients, I gotta comb through their charts, find out who had a myocardial infarction, who had pneumonia, and then create these cases and controls, and then measure these autoantibodies in all the patients very time consuming, very laborious, and you probably won't have enough patients to do this kind of study because you know, there's just, you know, among RA, not that many outcomes. So the, the neat thing, so you have to know the associations in advance, and can be, you can only discover what you thought of. But sometimes, it could be something that you didn't think of. You know, is there any way to screen all, a lot of possibilities, even things that you didn't know would be associated with these variations in autoantibodies? And this is where the phenomide association study comes into play. I'm going to guess that many of you have probably heard of, heard of this method, even if you're in the, in the transmog conference. Um, so the phen just briefly, PHEWAS is a phenomide association. It's a method to screen for associations between, it was initially for genes and all phenotypes, using electronic medical record data. And this, um, this concept is around since maybe about 2005, but I would say that the group at Vanderbilt, Josh Denny, Dan Macy, and the bioinformatics group really made this possible. And what we've done in our group, because we are working, we have done a FIWAS with genetic data, but we have been interested in using uh, retooling the FIWAS for biomarkers. And that's the example I'm going to give you today. We're going to do a FIWAS using biomarkers instead of genes. And the main role of this VLOS, again, is as a hypothesis generating tool. We don't really know what these autoantibodies mean in RA. We don't know why. There are different levels and different people. But we want to take a look at all the different phenotypes, potential phenotypes out there, and what, whether these autoantibodies can subset disease. So uh, just reviewing what a VLOS is, you all know what a GWAS is. On the x-axis, you have the chromosomes and the SNPs. On the y-axis, you have the P, and then what you're looking for is the association between each variant and like a, 
phenotype status. So RA, yes, no. So you, know, you go through about a million SNPs and you're doing a uh, million comparisons to see if that SNP is related to rheumatoid arthritis. In the PWAS, um, you're doing something a little bit different now. On the x-axis, you have phenotypes. On the y-axis, you're still looking at like a negative log P. But this time, what you're looking at is you're looking at whether, let's say, a genetic variant, let's say a loss of function mutation, is associated with each and every phenotype. So now you're doing a lot of comparisons, but you're going down by phenotype. So is uh, this loss of function, so is this loss of function one associated with rheumatoid arthritis, you know, psoriatic arthritis, and you know, cardiovascular disease all the way down. So what are these phenotypes? I just told you that ISP9 codes are not great. Um, so uh, right now, the state of the art really is still using those high CD9 codes, but moved in a different way. So the IC9 codes are now grouped by, uh, there's a phenotype mapping algorithm that the Vanderbilt uh, group developed. It maps these IC9 codes into about 1,300 clinical phenotypes. Why do we need this? IC9 codes are made for billing. Uh, they're not, for research, they're okay, but for those of you who have worked with IC9s, they can be redundant, and some of them are completely non informative. So what the Vanderbilt group did is they grouped it into, uh, this is what they told me, they grouped it into groups that they thought would be more relevant for genetic studies. But it's still IC9, so you're still limited in a certain way. Um, this is just a, a tool, this is exactly, we use the um, mapping algorithm that they have online, it's freely available. And so we went back to our EMR research platform. Now we have the EMR data. Now we have the IC9 codes mapped to about a thousand phenotypes. On the right side, we have our biospecimen samples, and we checked our, you know, research-oriented, research autoantibodies on everybody. And so, we ran the analysis. I just want to tell you what's on the back end, and this is the most simplistic approach, but I think it helps you to see what we're doing here. You think of, um, it's a many logistic regressions where you have phenotype yes, no, and the phenotypes are a thousand phenotypes. And age, sex, SNP, in our case, it's actually going to be biomarker. Um, traditionally, it's a SNP or a variant. And you, you know, do many comparisons and you find from it correct. Now, as I mentioned, these are biomarkers, so we had to retool this a little bit. I'm not going to go into detail on the methods, but there's a lot of issues. The autoantibodies are highly correlated, so you can't really, uh, first of all, it's continuous and high, continuous variable that's highly correlated. Um, and there's also high correlation between the IC, even the FIWAS groups. Uh, and so we, uh, we consider significance using a false discovery rate. And we also applied a high dimensional cross covariance matrix for all the correlations that will be happening in the autoantibodies. And I'm going to skip to our results here. Um, this is how we tried to visualize it. Um, we, haven't, we didn't really see paper out there yet for how to do biomarkers in VWAS. What you have on the x axis are all of the VWAS groups, and this is the, the way they're described, that had a significant association with one of the groups on the y-axis. And what the y-axis is, is the targets of these autoantibodies. So for example, fibrinogen actually has nine antibodies targeting it. It's a big peptide, so there's like nine types of autoantibodies that are binding to it. Whereas, let's say, biglycan had two. So rather than testing each one, because you can test fibrinogen nine times with biglycan two, and it's really not fair, we group them together and use their, uh, their data together to test for association between fibrinogen autoantibodies against fibrinogen as a group and the thousand types of phenotypes. And so we saw a lot of stuff here, and just I just point out two examples of things that were, were rather interesting. The first was the association between other alveolar and gridoalveolar neuropathy and antibodies against fibrinogen. So we saw this with up, that's interesting. We never it's never been reported. Go back to the literature. Of course, it wasn't reported exactly this way, but there was some data saying hmm, there seems to be an association between the titers of these novel athletes and interstitial lung disease, which falls into this category. The reason why that's important is because of rheumatoid arthritis, patients are at risk for uh, kind of inflammatory uh, diseases of the lung, including interstitial lung disease, alveolitis. And it's asymptomatic for a very long time. So we actually, and we don't do chest x-rays routinely. Some of them can't be caught on chest x-ray. So we actually don't know the patients have it until they start coming in short of breath. And by then, that's a little too late. So if there's any marker that can find these patients earlier or help us know that even, even if they already developed it, but it's subclinical, it, that would be helpful. So there's actually a junior faculty in um, the group that I work in, and he's going to take this and move forward with uh, looking at other potential biomarkers of lung disease. 
The other disease, and this is, um, so I actually, on the clinical side, I study RA cardiovascular disease. RA patients are two, one and a half to two times the risk of cardiovascular disease compared to people of the same age, gender, and cardiovascular risk factors. And we know that's due to inflammation, but again, you do the Framingham uh, risk score, you know, age, gender, smoking, hypertension, it underestimates risk by about 200% in women. So it just completely underestimates risk. And so again, it's helpful to have a marker that tells you you should watch out for this person a little sooner before they have a heart attack. So I think in a sense, as I mentioned, this is still hypothesis generating. We still have to go back and test that hypothesis, but it pointed out things that we kind of knew. So actually the fibrinogen and ischemic heart disease association is known. Um, but it shows other areas where the autoantibodies may be subsetting disease that would be helpful clinically for treatment. Right, so the first implication I talked to you about, now we're going to go after this marker as a potential marker of inflammatory lung disease. But what I wanted to point out about this platform, and this is based on, so I mentioned, you know, this is I2B2 in partners is built on top of RTDR, but this platform with organized electronic medical record data um, adding NLP on top with a biorepository really gives us a platform to study relationships between biomarkers and different features of disease. So, you know, for instance, we could look at biomarkers and treatment response. Again, treatment response will need to be careful phenotypes. Or we can go back and select patients with specific clinical characteristics for clinical studies, which, um, which I know a few people have already pointed out today that it's helpful to be able to subset patients to know who to recruit. And so I'm going to end with the tools wish list. Um, this is, as I mentioned, it's not, it sounds like Transmark can already do a lot of this. I, I haven't, I, Paul has demoed Transmark. I've been very impressed and I want to have the opportunity to use it. Um, on my end, as a more of an end user, a clinical researcher, what would be really helpful is to have the genomic data more integrated into, with the EMR data, so it's easier for me to take a quick look at. I think no matter what, the end product, the entire study, don't believe can be done on, you know, on a interface. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I don't know if that's where you guys are moving. But I think when you're doing a, a study, there, there are many steps to a study, but to even initiate the study, it helps to have some readings, understand what's feasible, whether you have enough patients, whether there's even a signal of association. And I think that's where uh, Transmark can be really helpful um, in adding to I2B2 with genomic data, with annotation data. So I want to know if Polyphen and SIFT are saying, are think that this is a damaging uh, mutation. Um, it's hard to know that with the current platforms we have now. I'd like to have NLP integrated into the platform a little better so that we can easily, uh, Sean showed you the nice uh, workbench or RPDR interface, and that's able to cross-reference IC9 with NLP and genetics. And I think one of the things that I come across all the time is I want to be able to do a gene lookup. Like, if someone has a SNP, is it associated with this particular phenotype or trait? And it'd be nice to be able to group it by IC9 codes, but also enter, create your own rough phenotype in whatever interface it is to say, I'm looking for, um, you know, a patient with this type of characteristic. And then uh, visualization, which it, it sounds like that was covered already, but uh, I think temporal visualization of the timing codes, uh, like Ricardo just mentioned, it would be also extremely helpful. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the I2B2 team and the Brigham Section of Clinical Sciences, who are in base, and uh, thank you all for coming. Correct. Yeah, so we don't know. This is why uh, somebody has to go back and do that that more prospective study. So when you ask about the private engines, it was heterogeneity. We did PCA and they clustered into certain groups, and it was a certain group of five engines that had the signal. But I think it was helpful to start with the bigger group to say there's a signal and then hone in rather than do the, all the different individual uh, analyses or uh, Comparisons first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to.
to switch it with some examples from the Transmart community. Can't read this. They have it loaded. <laughs> 